Welcome to Concordia Theological Seminary and our lectionary podcast. Uh, t- today is the uh, proper 14 or the 12th Sunday after Pentecost, and our text will be Luke chapter 12, verses 22 to 34. Now, as you might recall, last week we dealt with the beginning of Jesus' discourse in regards to possessions. And as we examined that parable of the rich fool, the message was pretty clear. Being rich toward God is to believe that God is the giver of all things, even life and salvation. To demonstrate, though, one's belief is to share these gifts of God with one another. Now, at this time, now the discourse, the discourse will turn specifically back to the disciples. We've been addressing the crowds with the, with the parable. Now, it's coming back to specifically to the disciples. However, the topic is the same. Possessions and their relationship to the kingdom. Again, there are many distractions in the journey through this life, through this life on to the next. And as we are all aware, painfully, I think, not just from the textbook, from just the evidence around us, possessions are one of the greatest distractions. Whether the lack of or the pursuit of even more, possessions cloud our eyes and take our focus away from the true treasure. They take our focus away from the kingdom. Once again, I'm giving thanks to Dr. Arthur Just for his fine commentary on Luke in the Concordia Commentary series. So basically here, as we begin our discourse, or this, uh, as we begin our pericope anyway, verse 22, in many ways this text is Jesus giving his disciples an explanation and a meaning on the parable of the rich fool. fool. And these words do not appear to be meant for the general crowd. Again, this is a crowd of many thousands, but now Jesus is focused down to his followers here. And he does that. He begins with um, that lego himin. Very common thing for Luke to do, by the way. Luke, uh, when he's uh, working with discourses, uh, especially when he wants to introduce a teaching discourse, uh, he will he'll resort to that phrase. He's going to do it again here in uh, verse 27. We'll point to that when we get there. So, I say to you, and notice he begins, and, I, and you need to watch this as we go through here, because Luke is going to use in this pericope 10, 10 imperatives, one right after the other. So, we begin with... Uh, this imperative, the merimnate, and it's uh, negated here with the may, mera, the may right here, merinate. Okay, do not be anxious, do not uh, worry, uh, don't worry about, uh, again, suke, suke, about life. Don't worry about, uh, about your, yourself, about your, your soul, about your relationship to God even in this case. So this is our first imperative. And then as we move on to verse 24, right away we have our second imperative in the text. The kata, kata noesata. This, um, this word to consider or to ponder. Uh, the idea, in this case, the idea of giving very careful consideration, a very careful study in order that you might learn something. Uh, it's very peculiar. This word is peculiar to Luke. Uh, the only other place you see it is actually uh, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 3. That's the only other place in the Gospels where we run into this. And so he, he says to consider, to ponder, the korakas. This here, the ravens. Kind of interesting to see this 
Uh, it, I think very interesting to note that Jesus is basically telling people they need to consider, look at nature, observe nature, in order to understand theological truths. What I think is interesting about that is that's what Old Testament wisdom literature will do on occasion, like Proverbs or Song of Songs, you know, note both written by Solomon. They will call upon you to look at nature, the example of nature, in order to help you understand a theological truth. And Jesus is doing that here and will continue to do it. Uh, let's look at verse 25 then as we move through here. The donatai, to be able, to have the power, you know, from dunamis. Uh, and then we have this, um, yeah, this helekion uh, pekun. It's kind of a, a little unusual. It, um, these two together, you know, adding a cubit to your lifespan, well, a cubit is a measurement of 18 inches. That seems a little odd to add that to your life, but the idea here is probably best in context any th anyway to see as adding a short period of time to your age. And verse 26 refers to that as a, as a little thing. A little thing. Uh, Eloxistan. Just a little thing. And we can't do that. So we go on then to verse 27, where we find our third imperative, katanoia sate, third imperative used here. And this time the considering, the pondering, is the lilies, the wild lilies. That's, um, and again, Jesus here repeats, as we said we'd point out for you, but I say to you, the Lago de Jimin. And I want you now, and I think this is very interesting. We're talking wisdom literature, and whose name gets brought up here? Solomon. So you can see kind of the connection, the, the uh, nature and the, the way that wisdom literature in the Old Testament talks, and then we invoke the guy who's known for his wisdom, Solomon. So it's very possible Jesus has uh, done this to, to point them to the wisdom of what he's saying, and, and, he invokes, and he invokes the name of Solomon, which would, of course, people would recognize him as the wise one from the Old Testament. Okay, so as we move on, you know, the message here, as we see in verse 28, basically is this. God cares for the ravens and for the lilies, so how much more valuable are you? You know, this, uh, just, uh, the, the idea is, is kind of, uh, I don't know what the right way to say it is, but the idea that uh, ravens and lilies, they're just, they're part of creation, but they're not man. So if they're important to God, then man, you, must be extremely important to God, valuable to Him. He even talks about this, uh, an argo, argro, tone, Carton, the idea of field grass, um, you know, being used as fuel, being tossed into the fire. That's just, just here today and tomorrow burned up in the fire. Uh, the idea, of course, or the um, context of that is that field grass was frequently gathered and bundled up tightly and then it was burned for fuel or for heat because in many places there was not a lot of wood readily available was an abundance of that, but the grass could be tied up and bundled up tightly. It would burn well enough to carry out the purposes they needed it for. So it's kind of that idea. And now here in verse 28, then we're also um, want to point out this very strong word, the oligopistoi, you of little faith. Very strong language. You of little faith. You see, as we noticed uh, last week with the rich fool, this, this uh, being distracted over possessions becomes a faith issue. 
It's a sign. It's a sign of a lack of faith. Okay, so moving on to verse 29. See some more of this. We have, um, we have another imperative here. That's our, our fourth imperative in this section, uh, meaning uh, to seek. In this case, we have the negation then, so do not seek. Do not seek. And then also um, our next imperative, same verse, do not be upset, worked up, don't, don't worry, do not worry. And by the way, this word here is very interesting. This is the only time we, we see it used in the, uh, only time it's used in the New Testament. It's a hapax legomena. You may remember that language. But uh, the only time we see it used in the New Testament, right here. And it has this uh, interesting word. It has the idea of, um, of hovering between of hovering between, uh, vacillating between hope on the one hand and fear on the other. Kind of this uh, teeter-tottering in a sense between hope and fear. So don't be upset, don't worry, uh, that idea. Okay, so and then we get to verse 30, the ponta here is to be connected. Uh, if you're trying to keep track here, the, the ponta is connected to the tata or tauta the the um, the really this is a it's connected to these things not to not to gentiles but to these things to these teachings or this language uh, but not don't connect it to the gentiles it look, almost could be done but not quite the point uh, what is uh, basically the idea is what is the point of worrying when the Father knows what you need? Let me say that again. What's the point of worrying when the Father knows what you need? And the idea inferred here is that the Father provides. He provided for the lilies of the field. He provides for the ravens. Why wouldn't He provide for you? And if the Father knows what you need, then don't worry. Don't worry. Easy, easier said than done, perhaps, but nevertheless. Okay, so then we go on to uh, this word here, plain here in verse 31, the idea of uh, rather, instead, this, this changing now, a change of direction in the argument. Uh, and not that, rather this. So, rather or instead... And then the uh, idea is to, um, well, you look at your next imperative here, right here next to it, the zete te, the idea of, um, that's our sixth imperative, by the way, the idea of seek. And what is one to seek? Rather than worrying about the things of this world, about possession and everything, rather seek his kingdom. Seek his kingdom. It's a matter really of, uh, it's really a matter of priority here. I think that we have to contemplate here, a matter of order. It doesn't mean that these other things aren't important, but priority wise, the kingdom is number one, the most important thing. So seeking and worrying about possessions, First and foremost, if they're your number one worry, that's going to distract you from the kingdom. However, seek first the kingdom and all these other things are added. We've seen this language before in the New Testament, certainly. So seek first the kingdom and all these, others, all these other things are added. So now as we go to verse 32, we're going to see our next... Uh, Imperative, the phobu. That's our seventh imperative now. Do not fear. Do not be afraid. And then we have this uh, 
Very interesting word. A little hard to unwrap, but the odokesen has this, um, uh, maybe a way to talk about that is to say it's like the Father's, the Father, the Heavenly Father's goodwill in Christ toward humanity. This kind of a thing. The uh, edoke sen, edoke sen dune. So uh, that may be a, the best way to understand the, the goodwill here. God's goodwill in Christ toward mankind. So the Father... The idea here again is, uh, and we saw this at the rich fool, this idea of gift. So the Father gives you the kingdom as a gift. Uh, kind of reminds you of uh, the hymn from the LSB number 7, I think it's hymn 735, Have no fear, little flock. Well, this is what Jesus is now doing as he talks to them. He is moving them to see the, um, um, do not be afraid because the Father is giving you the kingdom. And notice then he does this, this talking in terms of, uh, he uses language of, uh, of the shepherd now, of the, of the Father who is addressing his sheep. And that's kind of an interesting move here, a good shepherd talking to his sheep. Have no fear. Have no fear, little flock. Your Father will give you or is giving you, has given you the kingdom as gift. Okay, so moving on to verse 33, we have our eighth imperative right here at the, um, at the very beginning. The polesate. That's number eight. So that means to, to sell. Sell. Um, and then our ninth imperative, put these two together, that's our ninth one. And then, which means basically to give to the needy. Uh, give to the needy, but not as a, um, as a commandment, I mean, it's an imperative, give to the needy, but the idea is the giving isn't because you give, you don't give because you have to, but you give as an act of mercy. You know, the proper understanding of what the gift is that has been given to you, then in mercy and in grace you give, you give to others. You give to the needy, in particular, using the word needy here. Um, and then the final imperative. The final imperative here, where is it? Oh, yeah, poesate. That's number 10, right there. Number 10. So now we have all of these imperatives. That makes, means to make, and what you're making are uh, purses or um, money bags, really. Money bags or purses that um, don't wear out. And the, the idea, of course, is, um, as we see in verse 34, a very, very well-known verse to us, the idea that uh, where, your, where your treasure is, there also is your heart. So what is first and foremost? What is your treasure? The kingdom of God? Are your stuff. Doesn't mean stuff is bad, but priority and order is very important here. So, as we looked at in these 13 verses, I want you to recap this imperative thing. We have 10 imperatives. They're in basically three sections. You know, verse, the first group of imperatives, first three imperatives are about food and clothing. See that in verses 22 to 28. You know, don't be anxious about this. Consider, you know, teaching about food. Consider teaching about clothing with the lilies. And then the second group of four imperatives in verses 29 to 32 are imperatives, four imperatives about the kingdom. 
Do not seek what you will eat. Do not be upset. Do not, no, seek his kingdom and do not fear little flock. And then finally in verse 33 we get our last three imperatives. And these three imperatives are attitude, about attitude toward the possessions in light of the kingdom. The first bunch, imperatives about food and clothing, about possessions. Second four, second group, four imperatives about the kingdom. Now these three imperatives about attitude toward your possessions in light of the kingdom. Sell your possessions, give alms, make for yourself purses that don't wear out. So here's the question, and I think this is the important thing for us to, to contemplate. Why do we have all these imperatives. It, it would appear that Jesus is trying to instill a sense of urgency, uh, maybe a sense of urgency, especially now because he's addressing disciples, a sense of urgency in his followers. See, Jesus knows full well where his journey, the journey he's on, will culminate. Jerusalem and the Passion. All these things, Jerusalem and the Passion, will suddenly take place. And it will put these disciples, it will put them in the role of heralds of the kingdom. The new kingdom that will be ushered in with Jesus' death and resurrection. There's a distinct urgency for them in order that they might be prepared. So this ongoing imperative idea, so that they'll be ready for their new role, uh, ready to proclaim the kingdom of Je after Jesus ascends into heaven. It's, you have to be ready. And this, trying to instill that sense of urgency among his disciples, uh, very important here. And maybe uh, perhaps we could talk about installing that sense of uh, urgency among our congregations, the members of our congregation, as we live in, in this world and look forward to the kingdom that God has already prepared and given to us. Well, God be with you as you uh, preach His word this Sunday. And God bless.